Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. This week, The Walking Dead, QI, Ordinary Lies and the best thing I've seen on television this year. Let's start with the greatest thing I've seen on television this year. Here is your first question and it concerns... I mean, not that, although it was almost worth the licence fee alone. I'm talking about this. We live in a strange time. Extraordinary events keep happening that undermine the stability of our world. Suicide bombs, waves of refugees, Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin, even Brexit. Yet those in control seem unable to deal with them. And no one has any vision of a different, or a better kind of future. An atonal English voice speaking simple sentences over found footage and in doing so joining the dots between hugely complex philosophical, sociological and geopolitical concepts. It must be dogged seeker after inconvenient truth, Adam Curtis. What's got his goat this time? Ten years before, faced by the complexity of real politics, the radicals had given up on the idea of changing the world. But now, the computer utopians saw in cyberspace an alternative reality. A place they could retreat to, away from the harsh right-wing politics that now dominated Reagan's America. Ah, the same things that usually get his goat. Capitalism, globalisation, advertising, the West's failure to understand the Middle East, the alienating effects of computers, and just computers generally. Oh, and keep fit. <laughs> Lovely use of Brian Eno there. Curtis's first film, exclusively for BBC iPlayer, Bitter Lake, debuted last year. Not having to make his films to a prescribed length seems to have increased his work rate. And that's good news for anybody who can handle bad news. Assad decided to get the Americans out of the Middle East. And to do this, he made an alliance with the new revolutionary force of Ayatollah Khomeini's Iran. And what Khomeini could bring to Assad was an extraordinary new weapon that he had just created. It was called the Poor Man's Atomic Bomb. Some late bad news just in there from when the urbane president of Syria was Assad's dad, Assad. Hypernormalization is a forbidding two hours and 46 minutes long. I watched it in one sitting and I can't recommend this method highly enough. His films are, after all, one thing after another. The lights that people imagined were UFOs may in reality have been new, high-technology weapons that the US government were testing. If you had to sum Adam Curtis up in a sentence, it would be, do have nightmares. But he goes about his business with such mordant wit and provocative calm, and we must applaud his diligent film researcher, Stuart Robertson. Even if you disagree with some of his sweeping statements and conspiracies, you'll still want to know what the hell is coming next. Donald Trump was elated. He thought he'd got his money back. Now, if hypernormalization is the greatest thing I've seen on television this year, the opening episode of season seven of The Walking Dead was the nastiest. The following program contains scenes of horror, strong language and strong violence. There are a couple of reasons why, to use Alan Sugar's phrase, I'm struggling. I've watched The Walking Dead avidly since it began in 2010. It's about a zombie apocalypse. It's tense and explicit. The prospect of evisceration lies behind every tree, and they even promoted their chief special effects man to executive producer, for good reason. Get me my axe. Get me my axe. However, episode one, season seven, was almost impossible to watch. Not because it was particularly scary or gory, although it was both, but because it paid off a sadistic end of season cliffhanger, which saw one of the show's white-hatted heroes die at the hands of this new villain. Jeffrey Dean Morgan as Negan, who is the law. I'm glad The Good Wife ended before this season began, as I would never have been able to relax around him as Alicia's grinning boyfriend. In terms of villainy, he's right up there with this cad. Ross! Hateful, horrible, I detest you! No, you don't. You never have and you never will. 
That's enough of that. Anyway, Negan makes a terrifying nemesis, but I literally had to fast forward over some of his sadism, which is not suitable for work or home. So here instead are some monkeys. <laughs> If you follow The Walking Dead, you may feel you've finally seen enough death and cruelty and innards at the cruel hands of its writers. You may even be considering bailing out after that episode. I know I am. Never mind spoilers, I fear The Walking Dead may have spoiled itself. Let's change the record. I noticed two directors using the exact same shot in two British dramas this week, first in The Fall. John Lynch having a sly miniature of vodka in the privacy of a toilet cubicle. Now, here's Con O'Neill in the new series of Ordinary Lies. I enjoy visual echoes like these. In both cases, a man is using a toilet for something other than that it was designed for. A sly drink and a sly peek at no, not porn, the CCTV feed a suspicious husband has secretly had installed to catch his unfaithful wife. I, I suppose this is quite common these days, is it? I suppose you get to do this all the time. Yep. It's not that I don't trust anyone. Relationships are all about trust. The first series of writer Danny Brocklehurst's workplace-based anthology was set in a car showroom in Warrington. This one's set in a sporting goods warehouse in Cardiff and features a fresh workforce with a lie each that is ordinary becomes extraordinary. The mundane to and fro of an office was subtly conveyed. The eureka moment about CCTV slightly less subtly conveyed, but it's well cast, and although not yet up there with precursors clocking off or the street, the liars thing is something of an albatross, I'll watch it for moments of hidden depth like this one from O'Neill with some prime face acting and called out by boss Angela Griffin. I need you focused, doing what you do best. So whatever is going on in your life, and if it is something that I can help you with, tell me. But please, sort it out. The first episode had a strong twist, as presumably will all six episodes, and that's the formatted pill we'll have to swallow. Perhaps one will have no twist, and that will be its twist. Have I got a right to know everything? Have I? Some extraordinary truths now with series 14 or series N of QI, one of which we took to be self-evident. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to QI, where this week the name of the game is Naming Names. There's an old Chinese proverb that says the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their right name. So let's get off on the right foot. Sandy Toxwig put her right and her left foot into the formidable brogues of Stephen Fry, and you know what? It was all fine. This was the moment when that became heartwarmingly apparent. When they say the police are quizzing the suspect, that's wrong, isn't it? No, that's from inquisitive Inqui so, oh, and inquisition. So that's a, that's oh, a good. separate... You've, you've got it. You're in the right chair. A <laughs> <laughs> little cold feeling, man. To say that it was business as usual isn't faint praise. It was helpful to have two regulars flanking the new hosts, and dare I suggest that Alan Davis was showing off a bit to impress the new teacher. I don't think it's an allergy. That photo is terrifying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going, where are my eyes? <laughs> <laughs> my eyes! <laughs> the rogues have got my eyes! <laughs> it was as jolly as ever, and although it's not as if Stephen Fry was anything other than in touch with his feminine side, Toxfig's feminism felt doubly righteous when she spoke about Mary Anning, fossil hunter. She wasn't allowed to join, uh, for example, the Geological Society of London. They didn't admit women until 1904. She didn't get full credit until 163 years after her death. Uh, the Royal Society included Anning in a list of the 10 British women who have most influenced the history of science. Well, was she not allowed to join the society because she was a woman or because she killed that dog? <laughs> 
nice to end on some laughter. Ramesh Ranganathan can be seen in Series 1 of Taskmaster on UK TV Play, where you can also view 38 episodes of Alan Davis as yet untitled. For your moment of zen, it's back to pointless. <laughs> Famous dicks. I don't know what everyone's laughing about. They're simply, uh, simply about to show you five photographs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to make a television show here, guys. <laughs> I'm going to show you five photographs of famous people called Dick. Yep. Uh, you need to tell us who they are, please. Very, very best of luck. Thanks very much indeed, Richard. So let's reveal our five <laughs> dicks, and here they are. <laughs> Thanks for watching. The item on the coffee table this week was a Halloween mask that I wore when I was presenting a very important event at the BFI and nobody noticed. Please do subscribe and why not watch an older episode of Tele Addict or go and check out some of those great comedies like Alan Davis or Taskmaster at UK TV Play. See you next week.